This video is not suitable for children under 13. Hello everyone and welcome to Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous. It's been a hell of a week. You know, I don't know where to start because I uploaded my last video on Thursday of last week. Friday morning I leave for work and I get stuck in the nastiest traffic jam in the worst place right in front of the town center mall in Kennesaw, Georgia. And it's because of a Porsche Cayenne, it's an SUV, speeding down the road and hit the telephone pole or a telephone pole right in front of a Starbucks so hard it snapped the telephone pole in two. The high tension wires were hanging in midair with part of the telephone pole underneath it and the wires were right across the car. So that, that was scary. That was scary. After that, we had a uh, snowstorm on Saturday that lasted for like, you know, it started at 7 o'clock in the morning and ended at 2. By the time 3, 4 o'clock came around, it was all melted. And uh, then there is this. This has been the bane of my existence for the better part of eight weeks. About 12 weeks ago, I did my every three year move from AT&T to Comcast just to keep the prices low because you know over time they take care of people that are customers of other companies better than they take care of customers that are loyal to them and have had them for a while. Meaning over time your bill creeps up so high it makes it almost impossible to keep paying it because it's so cheap on the other side of the road, right? Or and here it is, right? The gr grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Well, Comcast. Comcast comes in our neighborhood maybe about four months ago and puts in the one gig lines, just like I've been using with AT&T. I'm sorry to sigh here. <laughs> oh, about I think it's been four times. I, I say it's three, but I, I was corrected by my, my best friend who I live with. Four times in the last two months, we've had no TV and internet because of this damn box. This damn box has been hit, knocked, and tumbled by different cars, which makes no sense because that's a sewer grate right there. But you can see the, the grass being... Uh, a little bit on the lower right hand corner being brown from cars that have run over it. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, but I also know that not only did we have no TV and internet on Super Bowl Sunday until uh, the second quarter, but last week when I was trying to sit down and do our videos, I had no internet for a good um, almost 36 to 48 hours. I'm, I'm not sure because I had to go to work. Now, I, I could play games and hotspot off my telephone, but I have T-Mobile and I have no internet. Um, not, not a good connection in my area. So what I did was, instead of trying to capture Star Citizen footage, I built that Lego set on the right. That is the Saturn V, and that was what I did last week. And I, sh or I should say this week, I should have been doing videos. I didn't. I'm not apologizing. I have a lot of reasons for things going wrong, and it was annoying and upsetting, and I would have just come here, and I would have just made a big stink. But holy cow, that Saturn B is really, really, really big. Now, last week, I mentioned my Amiga, and here it is, and I'm going to be just showing you a little bit of what I'll be doing with this a little bit later. Now, this is an Amiga 1200 with a uh, 68020 in it and 8 megabytes of RAM. And it is going to be my, th this is my baby. What I'm waiting for is a black keyboard on this. It's a brand new shell that was made by somebody who uh, had a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo. And I love it. That's a floppy disk drive, a uh, simulated or, or I forget what they call it. It's a GoTech. Uh, it, it, it simulates a floppy drive. But that's it. it. It's stock with almost everything else. And here we are playing Wing Commander. And that's what I'm going to be doing on this. I'm going to be playing two versions of Wing Commander. This is the ECS one, the original uh, 16 color one, or 256 if you were able to do ham mode. And I'll be playing the AGA, which was 256 colors and uh, uh, 4096 or millions of colors, I think, if you were able to do ham mode. I'm not sure. This is the only computer left in my bedroom. I have to make space for it down here before we start to actually use this on the show. Now, the roadmap hasn't been updated yet. I mean, we're still waiting on 4.1 and 4.2 for the rest of the year, so we can see how we go into Q1 of 2021. Um, we might have a new Avengers movie by the time this game comes out. 
or maybe um, we'll have a new Halley's Comet visit by the time the game comes out. Nonetheless, there's lots of progress being made. Now, I could have put ships and stuff in here, but I'm more interested with gameplay, and these are the things I'll be looking at and talking about in the future. And I'm waiting for 4.1 to hit, because what's in 4.1 is going to give us a huge indication of what the path is that CIG sees before them after that planning meeting that they just finished in LA in January. In this week's news, we do have a sale, and the sale was based around the Valentine's Day ships that they've had for quite some time. 300i, Heartseeker, the Mercury Star Runner, which in my opinion is one of the nicest looking ships out there. Um, and, and that's about it. I mean, we, we, we could talk about other ships that are in that mix, but there wasn't the typical... February concept shale, sale, which I expected, and I don't know if they're going to drop one on us, but what we did get to see in the past week is the progress that they're making on not just the Carrick, which is going to be out and looking amazing, but the Hercules, the 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 cargo ships. We know that we're going to be getting the whole sea soon, and now they're doing other cargo ships, like the Mercury Star Runner should be out in 4.1, I hope, fingers crossed. You have the Hulsey and you have the Hercules. And I feel like this is going to help us flesh out that whole, um, I want to call it the logistics gameplay, right? The cargo gameplay, which means I'm hoping that at some point they drop us the whole A and the whole B because those were the little ships that helped unload the bigger ships so you can actually get cargo to the stations or down to the planets or the smaller ships that are able to go between stations inside of a, a planetary system not so much a star system or interstellarly and i'm really looking forward for that so i'm going to address a couple of comments on my show last week and they have to do with immersion and they have to do with population and this is something that's very important to me. I know a lot of people out there are like, just stop with giving me all these different features that make the game feel real and just give me a game. Because a lot of people might be frustrated, like I am, that we've been waiting for so, 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 so long for this game that you just want something. And this wonderful, um, almost persistence, almost persistence game almost persistent game it is just not a game because it's just missing so much right now and I, and I feel like there's going to be a lot added this year but immersion to me is one of the most important pieces of the game and immersion and server population go hand in hand with me because I want to feel like I'm not just this lone person in the middle of I don't know if you remember the commercials where the guy's running back and forth all through the different places and he's like, hey, where is everybody? And then they talk about the low airfares and how people are just going on vacation or holiday if you're from Europe. Um, to me, I feel like that when I go to different cities. It's just like there's nobody there. I could play Star Citizen for a while, see that there's 20 people on, maybe 30, and I see nobody. And the biggest problem with that right now is not that I see nobody that's real, because I'm going to say it this way. Say you have a server that can handle 5,000 people. And I know that CIG has aspirations to handle more than that, so I'm going to keep it to 5,000. And let's say it's two years from now, so we don't have two star systems. We're up to eight, because suddenly Star Citizen is kicking into high gear because Squadron 42 was released and now they have a lot more people on making Star Citizen. I'm just saying, this could happen. I'm not saying it's gonna, but it could happen. So you have eight star systems. So you have eight planets. Each one of those eight planets has about five landing areas. So now you have 40 places to put thing, you know, for people to be in those eight systems. But then you have four moons in each one of those. So now you have eight times four, that's 32 moons they could be on with the 40, you know, you could be going on with this. So you can have hundreds to thousands of places for those 5,000 people to be. So you're really going to feel at times 
that there's nobody around you except for the people, the real life people that you take with you because Chris Roberts wants this to be a game experienced with your friends and family and not just a game that you go in and play by yourself. So this is one of those things that to me is game breaking or game making, right? How do you how do you split that difference? How do you make it seem immersive, seem like you matter, seem like you're not alone in the game, while at the same time giving people a lot of places to go and a lot of things to do? Because remember, some people might be mining in caves or mining in asteroid belts or mining planets off of rocks, you know, or mining rocks off of planets, sorry about that. Some people might be moving cargo, some people might be bounty hunting, others might be salvaging, others might be going on mercenary missions to take out Vandal outposts that they suddenly found popping up inside their star system. So people will be doing all different things. But when you're done, you're going to be going back to different planets, different stations, different moons, and there has to be some type of immersion there. Some type of functionality, feature set, some system that makes you feel like you're part of the world. Enter what Tony Zerbeck calls susumption. Now, it's taken me a long time to wrap my head around susumption because I've been an MMO player for very, very many years. I mean, I'm in my 50s now, and I, I even played MUDs. So, I mean, that's how long I've been playing things like this. But in the world of MMOs, let's go back to the original two that I played, which were, well, the original three, the original four, well, EverQuest and World of Warcraft. And we're just going to call them EverWow, whatever you want to say. Every time you walked into a city, the NPCs were in the same place, standing, moving, dancing, whatever. Exclamation points above their head, never different didn't have homes, didn't have jobs, just were there for us to go and click on and find out what either our quest was or our next step in the quest was or what our reward for completing the quest was. And that was it. I stayed there. It never rained. The wind didn't blow. Cars didn't come by. Horses didn't come by. That was it. So if you were playing alone, you felt kind of bored after a while. The assumption engine looks to alleviate this feeling of being alone. It looks to alleviate the feeling that the world is really dead and not organic, not living, breathing, and working around you. With the assumption engine, I, I don't know if it's AI or very intricate scripts or very intricate um, little mini shows that are played for you. With the assumption, the idea is that let's say Jane Doe and John Smith live on Yella. No, let's say they live on Hurston and one lives on Microtech, okay? So Jane Doe lives on Hurston. Jane Doe is a cargo runner. So Jane Doe has a home. She's living in one of the tenements on Hurston. She gets up in the morning. She moves around her apartment. She might wipe something. She might do something. She leaves her apartment. Now, all this stuff we'll never see, but it's just an idea that they have. The parts that we will see are her leaving her apartment. She walks to the elevator, takes the elevator down to the ground floor. Jane Doe leaves just like us, and walks through, let's say she walks through Lorville. She goes over to the admin building, she walks over to the console, she touches some things, she walks away from it. She goes down towards the train, but instead stops and gets something to eat, turns, you walk by her, she, go, she might say something to you, hey, it's good to see you again. She walks over to the train, gets on the train, gets into the, you know, the space station um, or the spaceport, and goes out to her ship. She gets on her ship, her cargo's loaded, and she flies it over to Crusader. 
and lands and goes about her day there, and then goes home, lands, takes a train, and goes back to her apartment. So Jane Doe's day is done. John Smith lives on Microtech. He has a job as a bartender up in the Tesla, I think it's Tresla, Tresla Space Station. He leaves, goes about his day, goes up to the space station, starts doing his job. You show up, says hello, you might have been there before. Maybe he remembers you, maybe he doesn't. I don't know how deep they're going to go with this. But he is wiping the bar, coming out from behind the bar, wiping tables, walking up to customers out there. You might hear them talking to each other and then comes back. In previous Chris Roberts games, NPCs were instrumental because you learned news from them, learned about bounties, learned about the goings-on in that bar or in that town, learned about different things that you're not going to learn about on the news stations that you were able to listen to, or on the message boards that you were able to see, or from the different guild leaders that you were going to. And I'm talking about things like privateer and freelancer, which had a lot of that built into it. So talking to the NPCs was always a very important part of the game. With assumption, these NPCs are given life. And if it works, and if it works on a scale of being able to put truly the tens of thousands of NPCs into the game that Chris Roberts visions, we're never really going to feel like we're running around in an empty place. Now, it is true you might never see the different people on your server today. In the future, as population limits are increased, people are going to fill, you know, real life people are going to fill out the universe. So when you're going to different planets, you're going to see them. But let's not forget how important it is to be in an organization in this game, to play with friends, to play with a unified purpose, to play and have goals that you're all accomplishing on a daily basis or a mission basis, whatever it might be. I'm excited about Star Citizen because a lot of the things, a lot of the failings of previous games, it is fixing for me. And the biggest one was, no matter where I went, it, was, it just broke the immersion. It took me out of the game. Whenever I went up to an NPC and they were always there, always just standing there, always saying the same thing, always doing the same thing, which was nothing. With Chris's 10 to 1 ratio of NPCs to humans, I feel like this world is going to be truly alive truly an organic, living, breathing entity of all, all on its own. And I can't wait to see it in its completed state. And that takes us to the end of this episode. I'm super excited to see what CIG brings us next week when they release 4.1 and 4.2 in the roadmap. I can't wait to see what their ideas are for the next 12 to 13 months of development on the game. You all know what to do. If you like the episode, please click the thumbs up button below. If you do, subscribe, and please subscribe to keep the channel, well, visible. And click on that notification icon when you do subscribe so you get notified of all my future videos. Thank you very much, people. And with that said, you all be safe out there, and I will talk to you soon.